Well, George, can't do it yet. I just want to wish you a Merry Christmas, but we both know we're still in Advent. Sorry. You wouldn't know it from uh, from <laughs> being in church, Kevin, because, you know, it. yes, Advent 4 is this Sunday morning, but mm-hmm. Sunday night's Christmas Eve, mm-hmm. and we've had the pageant, and we've had uh, dressing the Christmas cards and mm-hmm. all the stuff, all the choir rehearsals, and the meltdown of the organist and the choir master. Are we going to sing... Five verses of Silent Night or three verses. <sighs> yeah, Christmas does come with stress. I, 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 obviously, from reading of the gospel, the first Christmas came with a lot of stress as well. Off to pay our taxes, can't find a place to sleep. You know, it, it, nothing's changed in 2,000 years, the stress of Christmas. Um, George, we, we decided last week when we sat down to talk about what we're going to do for the next program, we're going to do a, a year in review. And so we just, you know, sat out the last week looking over news and items that happened since uh, January 1st of this year. And there's nothing really that uh, stuck out to us that we want to talk about that you guys already don't know. Because a lot of stuff we talk about, uh, at least every other show. The crash of the Church of England, uh, the horror that happens over here in the Episcopal Church with lawsuits. You've heard it all before. So George said, hey, Kevin, why don't we talk about... Uh, our predictions for the future. I said, well, we're never right. So whatever we predict, just say that that's not going to happen. Um, But before we do that, uh, we have learned a lot about our audience in the last year. Uh, We get emails from people, phone calls from people. uh, People show up at our churches uh, to say hi. And uh, you've had at least two or three really interesting stories, Um, especially got a phone uh, email from somebody who said, her brother had just passed on, uh, but he always listened to us. Yeah, I had some. Well, those were telephone calls. I one person, one woman called to tell me her brother had died, and I was very polite because I didn't recognize the name. And he was an avid Anglican unscripted watcher. He was a Facebook friend of mine. Uh, he followed all of Anglican Inc. and. He was an older man who lived by himself, and he passed away, and his sister came across his things and was going through them and just wanted us to know how important uh, our little show was in his uh, uh, his connectedness to a wider world. Um, it really touched me. It made me feel very humble yeah. that we were able to, oh, to get you right here. Some. Well, because... But, you know, we, we can be silly and we can be jokey about this mm-hmm. and that, but, you know, Kevin... When we started this, we really, you and I talked about this, and it's not about us, it's about the glory of God. And when somebody sort of gets that and feels that, and they feel connected to God and to a wider Christian community through this community of viewers and conversation, I just am so touched and honored. We always think it's about the news. George and I sit down, and we think it's just two good friends talking over Skype, discussing the news, having a few jokes. Uh, he he ha ha there and there uh, a lot of people get encouragement from our voices because uh, of the type of news report and, and the way we analyze it and you know at the end of the day George and I don't always get that uh, that we sometimes are a voice of hope in the church um, well yeah but we're critics but if you find us the voice of hope we thank you because uh, that's very humbling to us I had a call a week ago uh uh, it was in the late afternoon, and I think the person was calling just to leave a voice message on the church answering machine. And uh, when it's late in the day and the phone rings, it'll be me picking it up, not the secretary. And uh, she said, you know, she lived in another part of the state of Florida, and she was in her 30s, a, a woman, single woman. She was basically on a faith journey, and she had stumbled onto Anglican Unscripted. She had started watching my church's confirmation class videos. And she had attended her local Anglican church and did, wasn't particularly happy with it. Um, she, and then she had attended her local Episcopal church and wasn't happy with that either. And, but she was attracted to the Anglican way, what to do. And, you know, we talked about that for a good 20 minutes, half hour. And it's really wonderful to be able to help somebody, you know, in that journey in their life, um, to f- help them find their connectedness to Jesus Christ through a worshiping community. Um, This is a privilege to be able to do what we do. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, I don't think we ever take it for granted because before each show, we spend uh, a good amount of time in prayer. 
uh, we pray for the show. We pray for our families. We pray for those who listen to the show. We pray foremost that at the end of the show, God is glorified, not ourselves. Uh, we don't pray that we don't screw up. But it's probably why we've screwed up so much. But, uh, you know, it, it's really an important part of what we do here. And I think it really works. Yeah. To God be the glory. Yeah. Okay, on to the news. So we're not going to talk about all the bad things that happened this year, especially with the Church of England, where all is a mess. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the future of the church uh, now that we're here at the end of the year. Um, my first prediction, and it's a big one, is that Justin Welby does not survive the next two years. Kevin, I think I'll back you on that. Mm -hmm. I, I think we've reached the tipping point for Justin Welby and it's the George Bell affair, yes. and all the all the little things that emanate from that. And recently there was an article in the Telegraph, uh, the niece of George Bell calling on Justin Welby to resign. Gavin Ashenden wrote an op-ed piece saying Justin Welby, Welby must apologize to resign. And the secular press in Britain has picked up the fact that Justin Welby is, has damaged himself and the office in a way that is not part of the Anglican Wars. The George Bell issue, where a bishop dead 50, 60 years is pilloried as being a pedophile, and the Lambeth Palace and the Church of England issued all these press statements, and we did this exhaustive investigation, and after there was an independent review by one of Britain's top lawyers, this lawyer said they did a miserable job, and this is a joke and that there were people you know George Bell's secretary is alive they could have looked at his diary to see was he even in the country even in Chich even in Chichester when this happened mm -hmm. and none of this stuff none of the basics that you would do with any sort of accusation were done Justin Welby threw this man under the bri under the bus to improve the short-term image of the Church of England as being fierce on child abuse and what's happened is that liberals and conservatives are attacking Welby for un, in being unjust, for basically being unchristian. This has got nothing to do with homosexuality or women priests. This is Justin Welby, you have a character flaw. You are not fit to lead the Church of England into the next era because you are uh, a flawed human being who will not repent and seek the Lord. And it's not like he's joining the bandwagon going on here in America with sexual harassment lawsuits and accusations going back and forth in Hollywood, in D.C., in Europe. Um, this is a, something that's been going on now within Lambeth Palace for at least 12 months, 16 months. Kevin, uh, it's a different problem than the, uh, I think, what's it, the Me Too, hashtag Me Too yeah. campaign. But in some respects, this is almost as bad, if not worse, because what Lambeth Palace is doing and the Church of England is doing is under the cover of safeguarding, which is the term for child abuse protection, they are mounting a political cleansing of their opponents. George Carey has been laicized for all intents and purposes. Now, what does that mean? Well, George yeah, Carey you explain this because... He used to be the Archbishop of Canterbury. He can no longer even serve in a church. George Carey cannot perform the weddings, baptisms, funerals. He may not function as a priest in the Church of England mm -hmm. because Justin Welby uh, asked and the Bishop of Oxford agreed to remove George Carey's license to officiate, permit, his permission to officiate, PTO. And that was because George Carey made a uh, mistake 30 odd, 20 odd, 30 odd years ago on how to treat a child abuse case. Now, the mistake was not child abuse. The mistake was acting according to the standards of the 1980s rather than the standards of today. Mm -hmm. And on uh, 1990s, excuse me. That's all right. And, well, and Welby ha has thrown George Carey under the bus and the uh, and we're seeing this on, on small areas so that the new canons of the Church of England say that bishops may refuse anyone permission to come into a church and preach and teach and do anything under safeguarding concerns. Now, what does that mean? 
used to be that you could bring in somebody to preach one time or you could, you know, churches had a degree of independence. Now that's been taken away under the hysteria of safeguarding. Now don't get me wrong, it's important to have safeguarding and not allow child abuse to take place. But the crime here is that that has become a feint for the political control of the Church of England by the Welbyites, which is not a theological uh, party. It's a mindset. It's middle management. Yeah, and I have to agree with you there. It's it's interesting. You and I have been doing this show now for you know, three, four years, but to watch the Church of England uh, change over the last dozen years, it has gone from a dynamic church to one in uh, full crash. Um, but I don't see anybody surviving this in the next five years. Um, and I don't want to think that AMIE is strong and it's there to take over uh, when things fall apart, but I think the Church of England is going to be so bad that AMIE is a vibrant uh, alternative for those looking for orthodoxy in England. Ah, it's a tough road to hoe, Kevin, because England has got problems beyond the Church of England. Mm. Um, the society, the, you're right. It's a, English, is, English is a miserable place. Mm -hmm. um, I'm <laughs> going to be on that. It's a miserable place. Um, the problems that we have, uh, the opioid crisis, the crisis of the white working class in the United States, that we have that is, rain, is so large in our estimation, is ten times worse in the Church of England. They have two or three generations now born out of You wedlock. said Church of England. I think you mean just England. In England, excuse yes, me. That's right. We have two or three generations in England now uh, where currently half of all births are out of wedlock. And the people who go to get an education in the schools, they're miserable. They have no training. They have no education. They're not fit to work. It's why all the plumbers in England are Polish, because no one in their right mind would hire uh, someone from the British working class because of the way the culture has turned. And the Church of England within that milieu has decided more government spending is the answer when what is truly needed is a reform, a moral reform. Um, I know this is going to upset many of our English friends, but I really feel that English society, not just the Church of England, is staggering right now. Interesting that you talk about this. There's a new bishop announced for the Bishop of London. She comes as a person who was in the national health uh, system uh, where she was in charge. I'm assuming she was a proponent and supporter of abortion. Well, as chief nurse of the uh, NHS, mm -hmm. chief nursing officer, there's no way you'd be in that position if you were an opponent of abortion. Mm -hmm. Now, we've not heard, I've not heard word one on this issue. Perhaps it's because uh, abortion is considered not a moral issue anymore. Now, Rowan Williams and Kevin, you and I were miserable to that fellow. I'm sorry, we were <laughs> unkind. For years, <laughs> I think and he fact, appreciated us. <laughs> well, remember he told us in uh, Alexandria. He asked whether we had grown horns, and uh, then he went like this. And yes. I said, "Are you saying I'm a cuckold?" Or, uh, uh, <laughs> but, um, but Rowan Williams was a fierce opponent of abortion, mm -hmm. and now we've got uh, where eh, it's no big deal. Um, we've got the. the middle management uh, people who were successful in bureaucracy being promoted to become bishops not based on their charism of holiness or learning or pastoral skills but because they were good middle managers in bureaucracy I don't see that as the formula for reforming the church and building the kingdom of God No. well let's move on here to North America um, I would say North America, and my prediction is, you know, obviously the ACNA is going to, you know, continue to grow. I don't see them anytime soon being the replacement on a global scale for the Episcopal Church, because the Episcopal Church, under this new leadership, um, is no longer doing 
what it did worse, and that was just suing left and right and deposing left and right. Yes, there's still lawsuits going on, but uh, I, they've already kicked out all the conservatives uh, to the degree that they feel safe, and you know they're going to go back to the modus operandi and just be the Episcopal Church. I also think uh, at the next uh, general convention there's going to be some new liturgies, George. I don't know. Um, I th- I agree with you, Kevin, that the war between the Episcopal Church and the ACNA, it's over. Mm-hmm. Uh, neither is on the other's radar. And there's so much to be done in the United States that there's no real need to worry about the competition. Uh, you know, neither one is not competition to the other. Right. I it, agree. Where, where I am, the ACNA is basically minuscule. Mm-hmm. More, I mean, it, it, I'm, it's, it is what it is. Right. There are other parts of the uh, country where the ACNA is growing by leaps and bounds, and the Episcopal Church is just wallowing in its crapulence and decay. That's local factors are going to affect everything. The Episcopal Church um, is going to go is going to go through shakeout. We're going to see amalgamations of dioceses. We're going to see financial problems. But you know, Kevin, I'm doing great. My diocese is doing great. We grow, you know, we don't have, we haven't closed the books yet, but this will be the fourth year where we have 10 to 15 percent growth. Um, we're confirming 12 adults uh, next month when the bishop comes. Not a single one comes from the Episcopal or Anglican background, and so this, the Anglican sex wars, might as well be Balkan politics from the 1920s. That's an important point. If you look at the, the church I go to, uh, none of the new people are leaving the Episcopal Church. Um, we have Methodists, we have Lutherans, um, we have people who haven't gone to church for a long time and are starting to get back into it. But uh, whilst the church was formed over uh, struggles with the Episcopal Church, the new generation coming in doesn't know anything about uh, the past. Yeah, like I'm, I've got two women uh, in our who are not in our congregation, they're on the periphery. Mm-hmm. They are coming from Wicca. Uh, they are. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I got, my earpiece didn't do. What'd you say? That we have two wickists, wicked whoa. people who are in, into Satanism, into witchcraft, and the whole thing, who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, awesome. and are basically going through a very long process of cleansing their souls, their lives, their lifestyles. You know, coming out of. I don't want to go into the details. No, but darkness but into light. Into light. Mm-hmm. And to be perfectly frank, worrying about the Episcopal Church success or failure as a national institution, when you've got people like this who are at your doorstep, who are hungry to know the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know, they, come on, you know, it's a no-brainer. Uh, God puts you where you are, he plants you, and you bring, and you tend that garden, and you... I was planted here, and I'm tending that garden, and we're winning souls for Jesus Christ. We're not just reshuffling the 12 Episcopalians in the county. We're looking to build the kingdom. Well, and the cool. ACNA is doing that also. No, I, those, those success stories. And you, lots of denominations see those individual success stories. Uh, even denominations that are on the last legs, uh, there are, believe it or not, successful Congregationalists and Presbyterians and Episcopalians because they preach and teach the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, I gotta say, ACNA had a banner year. Since day one, and we go all the way back to Plano, Texas, you and I have fretted over the elephant in the room uh, because a large proportion of bishops um, do not support women's orders. And oh, I thought you were talking about one particular bishop, and I thought no fat jokes. But oh, no, 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 no. And so we, we said... He's uh, lost a lot of weight. He, he did, he's done great. And um, he should be a model for all of us. But we said, boy, this is going to come to a head, and I, I would not be surprised if we lost a diocese or two. And you're like, yeah, yeah, Kevin, you're right. I mean, uh, things could go really bad, and... Uh, when they finally sit down and, and have a, a little uh, uh, convocation over this, um, we'll have to see what happens. And you and I were extremely surprised, uh, both with the decision they made and their re- responsibility to stay together. 
and uh, that was a banner year for the ACNA because you and I, we didn't predict different, but we sure expected different. Yeah. If we look at the year ahead, the only thing that I see on the horizon uh, of, of newsworthy is whatever happens with all the various lawsuits, mm -hmm. South Carolina, Worth, so on and so forth. But frankly, those we're at those at the tail end of those stories. Um, I, there's not going to be a split in the ACNA. Now, somebody may get arrested for drunk driving. You know, there's always those sorts of stories. That Little things up. here and there, yes. But, you know, Heather Cook in the Episcopal Church, you couldn't predict that one. Uh, you know, the bish drunk driving bishop. Mm -hmm. Those sorts of things are always going to happen. But the, few, the coming year is not going to be a U.S. focused. It's going to be on England. It's also going to be on GAF. And the, the the relationship with the Global South. I, I have to agree with you there. I mean, last week the big press release was from the Global South. Uh, once again, we fully recognize the ACNA as a uh, member of the Anglican Communion. We love them to death. We want to see them at every event. Um, we've seen that type of talk before from the Global South, but they are reiterating because I think they also see the collapse of the Church of England. Yeah, now England, because of sheer inertia, is going to have a disproportionately large role in Anglican global affairs. But we need to take a historical picture. Uh, Episcop there has not, it, the interchangeability of Anglican clergy, a communion of Anglican clergy, did not start until 1874. That's right. Before 1874, Episcopal priests in the United States could not go into the Church of England unless they were reordained. And that stopped in 1976 when the first women were ordained, and now there are some places that won't accept women. So out of the 500 years we've had Anglicanism, only 100 of those years has there been a sense of a global universal church. That, after that part of our life ended, uh, it's going on 40 years now. Mm -hmm. And with the future, uh, what I, you know, the future for the past 20 odd years has been Africa, where Anglicanism has taken off exponentially. Europe has declined by the same exponential factors. But, you know, I think the change we're going to see in the next two, uh, next, not this year perhaps, but over the coming years, is we're going to see this Anglican world shift from South to Saharan Africa to Southeast Asia to China. That's you know that's where the market is for growth. That's where the hunger is. That's where the explosions are taking place. And it's also as Father Argo said in what is now the Muslim world, where Christianity is taking root in a way that has not happened since the sixth century. Ah, agreed. Now let's just talk about the biggest event for 2018. Uh, it's clearly going to be GAFCON uh, in Jerusalem again. What is it going to take for GAFCON to have a successful uh, conference? You know, not just a you rah rah session, go in there with our cheerleaders and hear the great speakers. Um, I think there has to be more than that because, the, you know, that's another third and out. Uh, we, need, we do want to see something different from GAFCON, but um, what's it going to take for a successful GAFCON? Well, there's two. Way, there's several ways to define that success. Um, now, let's just put on our newspaper hats. Um, I could use it. <laughs> you know, at the last general convention, I was there for Anglican Inc., Anglican Unscripted, but I was also there for the Washington Post and a bunch of other places who commissioned an article out of the whole show. Um, I don't expect that to happen at the coming general convention. And frankly, I don't expect anybody to be that interested in the secular press out of this forthcoming GAFCON because there's no make or break crisis. This is the point in which all things will change. Don't see that happening right now. There so maybe from, I would think there would be a little interest from the, Euro, the Euro, English, European, British press. But other than that, I agree. Yeah. Um, now, course if reporters can get their editors to fly them for a junket to Israel that's always fine. It is good. Um, and but then they'll try to tie it into oh Trump moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem blah blah blah. 
from a news perspective, what has GAFCON got to say it's not said before and said before in a much more photogenic and exciting way? Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer. No. It'll be, um, it'll be interesting. Um, because you and I love to travel. I love going to Kenya. I love going to Jerusalem. Uh, it, it's a lot of fun. Uh, carnival. Or just good stuff. Uh, no, carnivore. Did I say carnival? Carnivore. Yeah. That was a blast. So we'll have to see. But uh, they can't just do what they did before. It has to be something new, I think. The No, I mean... <laughs> I've got plenty of advice, but <laughs> um, you know, one of the problems that GAFCON has is primatial character. Now, that's great because when you've got five primates, all of a sudden you can say, we represent the majority of people in the, in the Anglican world. That's fantastic, and that's true. Then one primate retires, you get a new primate in, oops, you just lost 20 million people. Did you lose 20 million people? No, you didn't. Mm -hmm. But, you know, yeah. Kenya, Kenya, for all intents and purposes, is out of GAFCON. Tanzania. Well, let's go through the list. Um, they obviously lost Can uh, Kenya. What about Tanzania? Is that still on the? Uh, they were supposed to elect in Gen. They're supposed to elect shortly okay. a new archbishop, and we'll see which way that guy goes. But Tanzania is basically a paralyzed province. Right. It's divided. Uh, Kenya. Uh, the new archbishop may be a very nice, likable man, but he does not wield this, pull this, he's not the power there. That's a flip. Uh, he's, and he's been forced to flip. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got two Sudans now, mm -hmm. and we may see, and there's one archbishop, Ezekiel Kondo, in the north, and Daniel Deng Bull is going to be replaced in the south. We may Sudan see Sudan rise. Um, the Congo may take a bigger stance. We may see uh, Burundi show up this time when they didn't last time. Rwanda will be there, of course. Nigeria will be there. Uganda will be there. We may see Munir and East and some of the Middle Eastern churches. We may see Bangladesh, Pakistan, and some of the Indians. So we may see some growth like that. But what GAFCON really needs to do is do what was done at the Lambeth Conferences, which is form coalitions of bishops and dioceses. So that if somebody, you know, to say that uh, the only conservatives in the United States are those in ACNA, well, that's nice and lovely, but it neglects the fact that there are probably a half dozen, dozen Episcopal dioceses that share all of GAFCON's goals. And not reaching out to them, that's a mistake. Well, one of the key, you know, indicators is a Central Africa. Central Africa, no women bishops, extremely orthodox yet has a healthy, you know, as far as they're concerned, financial relationship with the Episcopal Church. Yeah. Now, they don't Central tell the people anything about the Episcopal Church. Everything that happens in America stays in America. But yep. they get the good stuff. I mean, Central Africa, uh, essentially, uh, it's four countries that are wanting to split into three provinces. Malawi, Zimbabwe, Zambia. The archbishops in Zambia. They don't have women priests in Zambia. Not going to have them in any time soon. Very conservative on all the issues. They're best friends with the Episcopal Church because Trinity Wall Street and other places send lots of money. And they're happy to accept it. Uh, Zimbabwe has been coming out of a dictatorship, so they have to basically keep their noses clean. They don't talk to any foreigners. Malawi is very conservative. North Malawi is tied tightly to the Diocese of Fort Worth. It's a natural GAFCON. But because you've Go, you can't, if you will, go because of the primatial uh, door. Uh, nobody can get past the archbishop in uh, Lusaka uh, to get into the rest of the province. So you know that, that's that's it's an advantage and also a disadvantage, and that's one of the things I would hope Gafcon would try to overcome. All right, we have done well representing our predictions for the next year. Um, we don't have to review next year because we know we'll be right. <clears throat> we'll see. George, what are your plans for Christmas? I've got, well, Susan and the girls are going up to Atlanta. Oh. My daughter, Laura, has a shift on Christmas Day. And so my wife and her, my other daughter are all going to spend Christmas Day and Christmas Eve with up in Atlanta. That allows me to do six services. 
<laughs> called Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, plus visit shut-ins. So I basically am trying to get my sleep now because starting sat this coming Saturday, I have got something basically scheduled every hour and a half wow. until Monday night. <laughs> we, the, for us, the secret is out. Uh, usually when we have friends over, we invite as many friends as possible and we rent out the, uh, the condo clubhouse, which is right on the shore. A lot of fun. Uh, people come over, we cook turkeys uh, left and right, and uh, everybody brings a vegetable to share and dishes and appetizers and wine and fluids. A lot of fun. However, somebody else rented it for Christmas before we got to it. So we're going to cram our friends into our condo kitchen slash living room slash dining room slash front area uh gonna put up a couple car tables and uh do what we would do in the in the spacious clubhouse here at uh sandpiper crescent do you have any snow yet uh we had snow it all melted off uh, about four days ago but uh uh we do have the cold every morning i wake up i look out the back window the pond is frozen over so uh, we have indications of winter, um, the, the gray, the dark, but we don't have the snow. Kevin, I hate to tell you, it's 82 degrees outside. You can hear the air conditioning on in the background. And uh, bright, sunny. Uh, uh, did I mention I'm in Florida? Yeah, it must be nice. Yeah, I guess the experience of Christmas is different in 82 degree Florida. But yeah. Yeah, I mean. We don't sing at midnight mass in the deep midwinter no, because the problem is when because we're at capacity and we have to put seat chairs in the aisles. And I can I, the last few years I could look out over the congregation. I you see the steam rise from the bodies. It's so hot, especially <laughs> with the candles and the incense. So it's so it'll be you know, and so the air conditioning kicks on and. Uh, but the exciting thing is, is we have all the latest gizmos to save energy, and we've got this thing where it shuts off all the lights automatically at midnight. And for three years running, the sexton has forgot to turn that off for Christmas Eve. <laughs> so on middle of Christmas Eve, the lights all go out. People think, oh, it's time to light the candles and sing Silent Night. No, no, no. We just look around for the switch to override. And you break into a palm tree instead of a Christmas tree. I know, it's, it's rough down there. George, that was a great show. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conker, and you've been watching episode 357 of Anglican on Screen.